Welcome to the Honest Designers Show, your transparent look into life as a modern designer. My name is Tom and I'm the founder at designcuts.com and this week I'm joined by fellow Brit and experienced hand letterer Ian Barnard, successful American retro designer Dustin Lee and the wonderfully talented South African illustrator Lisa Glanz. In this week's episode, we discuss how to transition away from full-time employment to go and work as a freelancer. Taking the plunge into freelancing can be terrifying, but we look at some ways to reduce the risks and make the whole process a little bit more manageable and less daunting. This is something my three co-hosts have actually all experienced themselves, and hopefully their experiences will inspire you to show what's possible. Let's get into the show. Okay, so this week we're talking about how to transition from a traditional full-time job to go and be a design freelancer. And I know for a fact there's a good number of listeners who might be stuck in full-time employment who are thinking about making the leap. Um, So hopefully this episode can shed some light on how to do that. It's also worth mentioning that I personally haven't done this I've always freelanced but luckily my three lovely co-hosts here Ian, Lisa and Dustin they've all done it they've all made the jump from full-time employment and all found success as freelancers so it definitely can be done uh, but really I want to pick your guys brains so uh, Dustin would love to hear from you on this buddy. Sure I had a a weird experience doing this. So I worked at a bank for years, even though I went to school for creative stuff in high school, I worked for a bank because I thought I needed to learn business. Long story. doesn't matter. When I was about to get married, I told my, (laughs) when I was about to get married, I told my, my wife now that I really need to quit the bank because I was miserable and I wanted to be a graphic designer. And she was amazingly cool about that because I said, I'm not going to make any money probably. And I quit and I went to design school and freelanced and did everything wrong. Did (laughs) Craigslist, did 99 designs, didn't bill enough, didn't have contracts in place. And then I got a design job at a startup in Portland, Oregon, and that evened things out for me. And I really hated it there. I thought I thought that was going to be an inspiring twist. Yeah, yeah I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, so, so it continues to suck at this point. I'm sorry, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was amazing because I was working somewhere and I was getting a regular paycheck and I was learning how to work on a team. That was great. I just, it's parts of the environment I wasn't super happy with, hence me going back to freelance. So I quit that right during Christmas and I just started reaching out to the people that I really, really wanted to work with. And I had a handful of them too, actually have me do projects and I did my best on that. And I really was focusing on people that did stuff I love. And those people eventually hired me for very regular work. And how, how did you find these? Were these big companies or individuals or what? These were, so I I was really into marketing blogs. So I started contacting marketing blogs, asking if I could do design stuff. And I happened to email one of my heroes who lives in Portland, Oregon named Jonathan Mead. And he hired me to do one little project And I did that project and then that led to a couple more projects and that eventually led to full time. And so I was doing that and then that was giving me a reputation because he had a big trap. He had a lot of traffic and that was giving me branding and logo jobs for other people that were aware of his brand that I had done for him. Mm, That's awesome. So awesome. And Mm. I think something a lot of people may be unsure about is how do you make that leap? So in your case, were you full time employed and doing this on the side a little bit? You didn't just jump out of full-time employment and kind of hope for the best? Well, I had before when I was struggling as a freelancer, I had sent out a lot of emails to people that I admired and said, I would do any, I would do work for you for free because I love your work. I just want to be able to put you on my site that I did work for you. And I only did that for people that were my my heroes, people I personally really loved what they did. And when I went to that job and left that job, it was purely just luck in a lot of ways it took a year for some of these people to contact me back and they started trickling in over the course of a year. And a couple of those turned into really regular clients. So it was planting the seeds 
early on. So I suppose the lesson is plant your seeds with potential freelance clients very early on and then nurture those relationships yeah. for a long period of time and eventually they'll pay off the sooner the mm. better. But but what I mean is were you working at this full time job and then freelancing in the evening and then kind of working out, okay, I've got enough freelance money coming in that I'm gonna leave this job? Or did you quit your job and go, Okay, I need work, otherwise I'm not gonna eat. I better <laughs> get some work here. Yeah, I I was working at the job and I was dabbling in freelance doing it, but not so worried because I didn't need to. But I had confirmed that I could get jobs doing freelance because I was picking the ones I really liked as I was working at the job. So when I left, there was still a, a really nervous hustle going on when I left. But I felt more confident because I had been getting mm. regular freelance jobs. Okay, sure. So, so you didn't have like a steady steady freelance career to jump straight into no but you, you but you had enough to give you a bit of confidence that you could go for it i had conf i had confidence and i felt like there's just never a good time to do it you know it's like having kids there's never a perfect time to do it you just do it yeah and and you adapt i think that's a great analogy actually because i know a few people who've had kids um who i'm friends with and they just say w what are you going to do like you you literally have to adapt you're not gonna you know watch your kid get sick or, or yeah you gotta make it work like you yeah you, you make it work yeah. you, you learn and and deal with it yep absolutely I, I don't i haven't heard a whole lot of stories of people where it was just smooth sailing it seems like there's always a struggle mm. of some degree yeah. curious if you guys have had that yeah for me i actually um i did it more structured in a way um, I was, I was too scared to go out on my own without any plan or without any kind of set income of some degree coming in. So I got hold of a friend of mine who I knew was doing her own business. Um, and I knew she was totally inundated with work and I asked her, I'd, I'd, I'd work for her half day. Um, cause back then the computers and stuff like that were quite expensive. So I said, if I work for a half day, would she be willing to kind of rent her equipment to me and her office and her phones and everything, um, the other half of the day so that I can grow my own freelance business. And then she just takes a cut basically. Um, and she said, okay, that's fine. yeah. And she said, yeah, she was like over the moon because of course she was, you know, so snowed under. So um, just me offering that was like heaven sent for her. And for me, it was perfect because like my kind of half of the day, I could obviously focus on my clients, do the whole cold calling thing. Um, but the, the first half of the day, I could see how she ran her business. So I, I basically learned how to run a freelance business watching her, you know. Um, but at the same time, I didn't have that risk, that huge, massive risk. Although the, the, obviously the salary was a lot less than my paying job, um, it was for me it was a kind of a stepping stone. And because I'm, I'm a bit of a wuss like that. I always feel like I need a stepping stone. I can't just dive straight in. So that's. I think that's called being sensible. It, yeah, I guess. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I suppose it comes from my mum. But yeah, for 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 me it was. Um, Probably the the best the better way to do it because I kind of learned for free if I can call it that through her, um, so yeah it worked out really well. It it got sticky though um, when my business grew and I, I I sort of started not getting enough time to do her work as well, <clears throat> so that part was a bit tricky. Um, but you know you work it out you, yeah you find ways to to make it work. Yeah, I mean, it literally is a transition, right? So yeah. what that kind of implies is it's a period of change. And that that's always rough. Forever. Yeah. Um, you know, you're, you're not constantly going to be in this state of flux. So no. I guess anyone who's going through this or is about to go through it realize that whilst you might be juggling a few more balls or it might be a little bit more stressful than usual mm. or a bit different from your normal routine, you will eventually adjust to find a healthy ongoing routine as a freelancer yeah you know it, it, it won't be forever no i must say those those transition phases i find the most stressful times i don't know if you guys agree with that but for me it's been i, c I can kind of count in my hand as a few times in my life that i've done like big transitions and they've been really really stressful um 
but but yeah, as you said, through experience, you know that even if you are in that transition, yes, it's hell at the time, but you get through it, and the end result is so worth it. I mean, I don't regret anything. You know, it's it's so it's so worth it. Absolutely, yeah, it can be exciting amidst all the stress. Um, yeah, but personally. Right now, for example, with Design Cuts, we're growing our team up quite a lot. And that in itself is a kind of transition taking us from where we are now to the next phase. Yeah. And it's exciting, but it's so full on. All I'm really craving is to get out the other side of it. Yeah. Like normality. <laughs> I know, yeah. it's horrible. Where, or you're just craving like, oh, can we just have a normal week where everyone's kind of ticking along, do, doing their thing? Isn't that funny, Tom? Do you find, I know you've taken some big risks to make Design Cuts what it is today. I'm curious if you found that all of the best things that have ever happened to me have happened amidst a lot of turmoil and stress. Yeah. Like mm. it, take, it takes taking a risk. I'm curious if you felt like when you did design cuts, did it feel like a, term, what is the word? Tumultuous? Is that a word? Or did I make that up? It is. It, yeah, it is a word. <laughs> was, it, was it a crazy time or did it go smoothly for you when you started it? Uh, well, you know the story. I pretty much didn't sleep for a year. Yeah. <laughs> as soon as I said that, I remember. If that answers your question, yeah, it was it was pretty crazy. <laughs> do you, do you look back fondly, or do you say, "Oh boy, what was that"? <laughs> um, I look back proudly. Of, I'm not sure I could do that again. Um, but I, it's it's like where you push your limits. It's like if you run a marathon or something you might not be dying to go and run another one the next day, but <laughs> you're, you're kind of proud that you could push to your physical limits. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, um, okay, Ian, how about you? Because you've, you've had your own path away from full-time employment, right? Yeah. So mine was quite a gradual thing. So it happened over quite a period of time. So I started, I uh, got my first job in 2000 full-time working for a, a design agency of printers and I stayed there for about seven years and then I got a job locally to where I live and it was only three days a week and I wanted to work there and I was thinking actually you know we could try and make this work and it could be good to see that what it's like doing freelance for those two days where I'm not there um, and straight out of that I, I managed to get a job for was it one or two days a week or those one or two days a week with um a couple of ladies from uh the church that i go to had their own design agency and they took me on for a year which was really cool so it wasn't too much of a because i literally didn't have any clients and so i came out of that and went straight into sort of a uh, two part-time jobs but i managed to over that year while i was working for them in the spare time get hold of some clients actually from my previous job who um, I I finished well there. I didn't burn any bridges. And so they were able to offer me some small jobs. Yeah, you talked about this before. Yeah, right, too the small jobs for them. Too small for them, yeah. But they passed it on to me. So there was like a restaurant and um, some other thing I needed to do. And just generally, just maybe um, after I'd done that year, they, they sort of brought me in for like doing, I know, a day's work when uh, a designer was on holiday or something like that. So there was sort of lots of little opportunities as I was building it. And then I a good relationship with the restaurant, which continued. And uh, I got some website stuff through the job I was actually at, um, which I think I mentioned as well. So there's these few jobs going on. And then I, uh, it was quite, yeah, like with you, I was trying to juggle, uh, I was working for a magazine three days a week, but that never was just straight three days a week. Sometimes I do four days a week uh, near the, deadline time and so at the beginning of the month it was always quieter on the magazine and so I'd have more time to do the work there but what was quite stressful and why I eventually left the magazine is because I had so much going on plus the deadline of the magazine at the end mm. of the month that I was always ill that day after the deadline month because I just had too much to do and I couldn't do it in the time and um so yeah eventually I just I was just getting really unhappy really uh, we were just really struggling and so my wife was still no my wife was part-time had our first child and then the day I left we had our second child oh, wow. and I went fully freelance <laughs> so uh, yeah you could say it was slightly you know a lot going on 
Yeah, and, just a little bit. You made uh, it through though. It, yeah. So, but that was, but that was also the day I started learning calligraphy. So it was all all good. There was all lots was going really? on. And, yeah. So literally, the day that my son was born was. <laughs> so what happened on the day? It was the second of October, and my wife went into labour, or she started getting contractions in the morning and it was deadline day for the magazine the contractions dumbed down a bit by about nine o'clock went in did a nine to five they started up again two hours later my son was born wow oh man <laughs> so uh yeah so so i don't know whether that was because she was doing she was doing a lot of pilates and stuff so i don't know whether she had complete control over over that part of the pregnancy <laughs> i don't know but um I didn't even get to finish my cake and coffee, which the uh, <laughs> midwife gave me. What? They don't do that over here in the US. They don't give us cake and coffee. I, while the I didn't get it. Labor. I didn't get it last time. So, but it was all you know. Two hours. It was all done. I feel like so, here, if if my wife was in labor and I was eating cake and coffee, like would, <laughs> there's something like, wrong with get that. Get the cake and coffee out of your hand. Like <laughs> this is not like relaxation time for you. No, she's she's sweeter than that. But I don't think she would appreciate me eating cake and coffee no. while she's pushing <laughs> right. a baby out. I, I was very I was very supportive, but she <laughs> with your uh, cake in your hand. <laughs> she'd done so she'd done so much preparation in her exercise and stuff like that that she was quite in control of getting my son out. I suppose. Um, <laughs> I I saw it. I won't go down that road, but you know, it's um how did the calligraphy come into this? Well, that was because the um my wife was breastfeeding with my son and she was watching the complete series to Downton Abbey. And I, I I'm not really a big uh, period drama fan, so I had 45 minutes in which to practice every night. Um so <laughs> okay. That is so. So that's so you're, sweet. Actually, your disdain for Downtown Abbey was the catalyst. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So, so if it wasn't for Downtown Abbey, you might not be on this call today. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Literally, literally, if I'd been a fan of Downtown Abbey, then yeah, there would be no cliff <laughs> fee. Wow. Because I literally wow. started. Yeah. So there's all those things, and I started. I got a click fee for Dummies Guide, and I literally I thought, okay, I'm gonna learn that while she's in the lounge, feeding and watching TV. I will. I will get down and I will just study this for like, um, so that's why it was like six months because that's how long uh, he, uh, we decided to, you know, feed for and uh, not not that we didn't feed him after six months. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> this is what, the best what I love here is that, in a long time. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, my girlfriend has pretty rubbish taste in television um, and I, I just moan about that, whereas you've basically f- founded a career Yeah, that's on that. pretty good. Yeah. So I think you, you've taken the high road. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, I don't, sorry, this seems to be nothing about graphic design at the moment. So, <laughs> yeah, uh, right. So to, to segue back to um, transitioning away so from employment. The stress, the stress of everything pushed me into going into freelance. I wanted to do freelance anyway. But I think it was just I was there, I've been doing for like I've been the sort of part time juggling act for, for seven years, so it was quite a while, and so that that meant over that seven years of doing, it, I built up a few clients that I'd got regular work with, and so when I jumped, I hadn't got. I think there's a difference between jumping from full time to five days a week, you know, filling all five days with work, whereas if you've got two days of work, then going up to the mm. adding another three days is is a lot less than five. So I I knew I had some and then it was just filling in the blanks and just trying to get more work when I'd done it. I've um I've never done cold kill calling like Lisa has. Um mine's been through relationships and I've never advertised. It's always been I think it's been for me, even um back then I think Facebook, I can't remember when Facebook came around, but I was posting stuff just to my general Facebook saying, you know, this is what I've done and people would see it or they'd see something else because I'm doing a lot of local stuff. They'd see it and say, oh, actually, can you do this for me? Um, you know, recommend that was the early stage of recommendations from mm. like family and friends yeah. and local businesses. You know, so, what, you know, what's kind of interesting kind of relates to that is I've noticed if you work for a design company 
it can be a little harder because they obviously want to keep the clients for themselves. And unless it's the case where like you had Ian, where you have some smaller clients that they can't take on, but you can. But I feel like I was really lucky because I worked for someone where it was not a design agency. I was an in-house designer that was a contractor mm -hmm. for this person. So other people were coming to him saying, how are you doing this? Who's doing this for you? And he was more than happy to spread the word about me because it wasn't, I wasn't taking clients from him. He was just lifting me up by doing that. So there's some big advantages, I think, to being an in-house designer for not a design agency, but for an actual business. Yeah. Because if your work stands out and is good, you'll attract clients and potentially build a client list because they'll be happy to share who you are with them, I would think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 100%. I, I always on these calls see kind of common threads that start emerging and already I'm seeing have a bit of a parachute. Yeah. And that can take Definitely. many forms by the sound of it, but mm. that could be go part time in your job if possible negotiate that and then start working two days three days one day a week on your side freelance gig to kind of soften that blow when you transition or you could put in the extra hours you could do it at weekends you could do it in evenings and start building it up that way or you could do like what Dustin did and you're not even doing the work but you're kind of putting in the effort to build up the contacts so you're not actually doing full on projects, but you're kind of planting seeds mm. um, when you do for leave, potential yeah. future projects. Mm. So, yeah, again, there's lots of different ways here, but I'm already seeing this as like a key theme, I think, for this episode is have that parachute, have that safety net. Yeah. Um, and don't just dive out of one thing into the other with no idea what you're going to do. I would also say for everyone listening, um, hopefully you're all loyal listeners who've listened to every minute of every episode <laughs> but if you're not um I, I would definitely refer back to a few um particularly the one on pricing i can't what, what was that guys episode eight or something yeah five six i've lost that. track Me too. Um, it was a ways but, back there yeah yeah it was one of yeah, the it was, first. A, it, was, it was a little way back yeah. but um yeah if, if you go check out the episode on pricing that is really applicable to freelancers because that talks about how to actually be re realistic in your pricing so if you jump out of full-time employment and just think oh, i'm going to be rich because my hourly rate's really high that's not realistic no. and we talk all about uh factoring in illness and holidays and you know time promoting yourself and doing admin work and everything else um and i think if you listen to that episode and run the sums that is another key step of this kind of transition away from full-time employment where you actually do some realistic maths on how am i going to match my salary yeah and you know my current salary at my full-time job and within that um I, I would really really kind of work out do I need to have savings and that kind of thing is like should I put some money aside and how long does that need to last me is it going to take me three months or six months to kind of find my feet in this new venture well I was going to mention Tom this might be we don't normally talk about this but this might be a good time to mention things like creating products or teaching or writing an ebook or making a course or or all those different alternative ways that designers can make money. I've mm. noticed, I know a lot of people that do that where they've found some sort of place where they got traction, whether it's through a course or creating products like we create or, or just anything where you're creating these side little hustles, I guess you'd call them. And one of them, they can give you that little extra money that says, hey, if I do walk away and wanna go fully to freelancing, I have a little, like Tom said, cushion from my savings and from a little bit of side income coming in from these extra things I'm doing that contribute to the community. Mm. I was just going to say that. Yeah. That I didn't, I didn't know before I started this sort of the power of uh, having a passive income to take the sort of pressure off um, having to, you know, you know, worry about every job that's coming in. Um, and if, if I known that back in like, when I first started the sort of part-time one, I could have built up a, you know, somewhere, you know, because I first started doing stuff like Shutterstock um, uh, before I sort of moved on from there. But I'm still getting like random payments from that coming in. So it's it's definitely an area, you know, whether that's passive income from selling products, whether it's like Dustin said, from doing course or stuff. I think there's more and more opportunities to get a passive income. It could be the case that you you know spend a couple of years on YouTube posting regularly there, you can get an income from the advert. 
um, or having ads on your site and giving away free stuff and uh, or blogging and stuff like that. So I think there's a many many ways mm -hmm. that weren't available back when I first started. So I agree. I I would almost put a caveat on that of perhaps do that in the extra hours when you're full time employed. Because if you've yeah. left your job and you're trying to be a freelancer, I, I would imagine the freelance gig's going to take up all your time. So it's almost something you want to do preemptively that's helping give you that cushion because you're going to have your hands full starting a freelance business. You might not want to start blogging at that particular yeah. moment. Agreed. Plus those things can bring in freelance customers. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's that's worth mentioning for sure. Yeah, I was just um, gonna say that. Yeah, sorry, go on, no, 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 no. I was just gonna say that. Um, just to iterate what you guys are saying, that it's so important to have that um cushion. But for me, uh, I, I try. I would go even one step further and actually plan that cushion. I think a lot of people don't think those things through. Um, they just they like the idea of freelancing and they they find it romantic. And yes, I want my own business, but they actually don't plan how they're gonna get there. And I think that's probably your first step that you should take is. And even work out a time frame. Like for me, it was I knew I wanted within the year, you know, within one year, I wanted to at least have so much money coming in before I left my job. And that so much money coming in meant working half day for, you know, this friend of mine. But for other people, it can be either passive income or it can be those freelance, you know. Um, Did you literally write this down or was this just kind of in your head? You were thinking these um, I I spoke. Uh, it, well, I'd never wrote it down, but it was very much in my head. It was a plan that I, uh, I spoke through with my partner. Um, you know, we kind of worked it out and, you know, he advised me because he's, he's a bit older than me. So he kind of gave me some good advice and we worked out how much money I would need to actually pay the bills and, and eat and that kind of thing. Um, wow. Yeah. So, so then you... That, yeah. So, uh, for, well, uh, uh, yeah, I just... You know what? You know why I'm so organized? <laughs> I don't... I mean, it's not a... I don't know if it's a, whatever, it's not an advantage. Well, it is an advantage, but what I, well, the reason why I'm so organized is that I get totally freaked out and I I get quite anxious when I have to worry about money. So um, yeah. So for me, well, it that's, was... That's good that you're rolling in mountains of money. No. <laughs> that must help relieve the pressure. Lisa always denies uh, this, but, you, I, but we all know it's true. It's not true. <laughs> <laughs> no, for, so for me, I don't want to have to stress because if you're not, if you're so stressed on getting that paycheck or the next, you know, job, then you compromise your standards. You compromise on the kind of clients that you get. You compromise. You're not going to feel inspired. Yeah, you, you you compromise your creativity, all those things. So, um, f f so it was so important that I actually had that sorted that I could actually concentrate on building a proper business. So um, get so get rich first is your advice. No, <laughs> <laughs> no, definitely just get enough money to cover the bills. Whether it's actually in savings as well, you know, like you could. No, you I, could... I I love that you mentioned that because um, in general kind of business, there's this concept called like ramen profitable. Oh yeah, just yeah. which is I don't, I don't enough know. to as in like ramen noodles because they're oh, cheap food. Okay. Uh, so so the the concept is how much money do I need? to literally survive and get by. Um, yeah. So someone might be on a, a pretty good salary and they, they, they're they not happy though. So they want to transition to being freelance and ultimately be successful. But at least at the start, it's worth looking at it and saying, okay, so what's my number to, mm. as you say, pay the bills and eat and pay my mortgage or whatever. Yeah. And if that ends up being half your cu current salary, then fine. If you're If you're willing to kind of make that sacrifice for the short term, because you're trying to think more long term, yeah. it's fine. It's like, okay, well, I'm not going to go to fancy restaurants. I'm, I'm not going to go on yep. vacation or no, whatever. No, I ate rice a lot. Trust me. Yeah. Tom, Tom, <laughs> there you go. Tom, would it be too off topic to ask, because I feel like this is a question that comes up for people a lot. What about when you want to do that? And like you said, be ramen profitable. When I was 20 or 25 and single, that's not a problem. I can be ramen profitable and no one cares, but when I when you have a wife or a long term girlfriend or boyfriend or husband whatever, they might not like the idea of ramen profitable. But like I had to do it, and I'm just curious what your guys' takes are on your significant others or people that are part of that just that happening. Mm. How have you handled Mine's that? Per personally, I think it's different for every relationship yeah. and every couple. Um, I would say communication is probably the answer. 
and it's going to be different again if if you're married versus if you're married and have kids and all the costs are going to go up and it's like well maybe you don't want to pull little timmy out of private school or whatever because he's got great (laughs) friends there um so every situation is going to be different but i would say just communicating if you're really upfront and honest with your partner and you say this is really important you don't like me coming home from my full-time job miserable every evening and I'm not fun to be around for the family Mm. and I think I'm going to be so happy doing this and you know you only live once and I want to give it a punt but here's a again it's about foresight so you're not blindly going into it and then everyone's in for a nasty surprise so if you say okay here's how much you know I've done all the maths here's what we need to earn here's how our lifestyle would look in the short term and I I know this is what I want to do, but I want to talk it through with you. Yeah, it's important. And maybe they still turn around and say, absolutely not. I want to go on eight vacations a year. (laughs) And then that's that's a different situation, perhaps, for your relationship or, you know, you have to compromise or whatever. But I think just talking about it is key. I think I did it quite dumb in a lot of ways because, like I said, when we were getting married, I told my wife, well, yeah, let's get married, but... I really need to leave this bank because I'm going to be miserable. And I know if we get married, the next step is we're going to get a house and we'll go have kids. And next thing you know, I'm going to have to pay my mortgage payment and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to be able to stop being a banker and I'm going to be miserable. And she was cool enough or believed in me enough to literally carry us for two years while I basically struggled and made all sorts of mistakes. I think a lot of people would have said, you're insane. Why are you dragging us down by doing this? But she, she literally supported me she while I did horrible stuff for two years trying to make it work. Yeah, that's amazing. And that's testament to you guys as, as a couple. And I've heard that from a few um, community members, actually, at Design Cuts, where we get really nice emails and they're, you know, podcast listeners, in fact, some of them. And they say, I'm, you know, I'm really struggling, but I'm starting to make a bit of headway and the podcast helps but a lot of them actually say my spouse is supporting me Mm. while I do this Mm -hmm. and and that's awesome like good for you if if you know you can support each other in that way yeah I think it's quite important to at least have your close uh, people around you supporting you because if you're fighting that um, Mm -hmm. as well as trying to fight and in getting your business going I think that's horrible Um, but as you said Tom I guess every relationship is different and I yeah, I mean, I can't. We can't advise on relationships, but um, we can. <laughs> well, we can yeah, just I just flip, the, flip the podcast into something new. Yeah, personally, I just think that <laughs> the honest love session. <laughs> I think personally, your your partner should support you because it's about your um, yeah, it's about your happiness. I mean, when you when you on your deathbed, you're not going to be all oh, darn it, I you know, stuck it out as a banker, even though I was miserable and, you know, <laughs> that's, that's, that's yeah. not going to be something you're going to be proud of, but you are going to be proud of the fact that you struggled And that's that pretty much what I told to her. I, I said, I can't live my life like this. I'm going to regret exactly. my life if I do this. Exactly. And I was just really honest with her about it. Yeah. Yeah. But, but, but having said all of that, it's only fair to your partner and, and your family to be honest with yourself and know that you've mm. done the maths, you've done the background research, whatever it takes. You've you know you've tried options. You haven't just kind of literally run off the edge of a building and said, right, you know, universe <laughs> has to catch me now. Um, you know, you got to do your bit. Yeah, it's not a knee jerk reaction. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it, it would... I, I would sorry, I'd add a caveat to that that um, try not to have a romanticized notion of what freelancing is. Oh, as yeah. Well. And that goes beyond the money because it isn't all rosy, no. far from it. It can be a lot more stressful. It's not a pretty and ride. I think maybe the only way to do that is to actually do some freelancing. Mm. So if you blindly went into it and you had no experience and suddenly you're like, ah, I actually realized that I hate dealing with the stress of client relations and I preferred when my boss used to do it or my coworker used to do it. Yeah, because it's that not That wouldn't be a great situation. Mm-hmm. Um so I, th- that would be one element. And maybe if you, if you do Ian's approach of doing a couple of days freelancing a week, that lets you test the water. Um, it's also worth mentioning that if you hate it, you can always go back. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And maybe that makes it less scary. So if it's re- if it completely fails, you're like, fine, on your deathbed, you're like, at least I tried. Right. Um, or if you're miserable and you don't like it as much as you thought you mm. would, guess what? You can go and apply for another job. It's not You're not doomed for life after that. I like what you said about that, Tom, because... I think that brings up the good point that you should try to stay in good graces with all your previous employers because you don't know. You might do it for a couple of months, like you said, and hate it. 
And it's so much easier if you've had a good break with your previous employer and you can come back and say, hey, I'd love to work for you and they want you, as opposed to you just packing your bags and disappearing one day and never showing up again or something. <laughs> and giving them the middle finger as you walk out the front door. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. <laughs> I mean, and uh, yeah, and as you said, you actually got work from your uh, your previous employer. Yeah, yeah, so from both. both um, like I did a cover from the magazine after I'd left. Hand-lettered one, obviously. Uh, <laughs> and then, <laughs> um, yeah, from my previous... I, You know, and I'm still in good relationship with, with my my first employer so um you know uh even if you know i was in in it went back to doing more graphic design stuff you know they'd be um definitely open to working with me more at the moment i'm not doing so much of that side of things um but i think it all depends on how much you want it because if you yeah if you're in the opportunity you know if you've just left school or you're you're just you don't have much responsibility mm-hmm. um like downsize stuff like if you'll get renting a property just because you want to do your own space and stuff like that but you want to go freelance then move back in your parents and just mm. you know good point mm-hmm. take that burden of money out and just work at it for a few years and then you know build up that thing so then you can go back into it so it's just about that you know you spend most of your life at work you're either sleeping or you're working for the yeah. majority <laughs> of your week so you want to be doing something that fulfills you and you enjoy um I know not everyone has that opportunity and we were in a very blessed position for that. But if you can do stuff in your lifestyle to, you know, to put on hold just to build it up, you know, whether that's like for me at the moment, I'm cutting down my buying coffee out, you know, takeaway coffee and making coffee at home because it's a lot cheaper. Um, uh, And, you know, you know, can save a bit of money here and there. And so, you know, because the problem with freelance is that every month is different. There's not like I get this exact amount of money in, Mm. you know, like you do with a salaried position. And so actually sometimes you have to take cuts certain places like clothing, you know, going out, like you say, um, holidays, stuff like that, just because you want to build, put in a buffer, you want to get in a certain amount of money. And, you know, we're living longer now, so you want to... Um, getting something that you enjoy so it might mean that for for a few years you're just you know not doing all you want to do just Mm. because you want to get that that job in place first and then worry about it later on and you really almost have to have a or try to develop the ability to deal with uncertainty Mm. whether it's freelancing or whether it's running a business any of those kind of things you just don't know for sure what's going to happen and i'm constantly trying to manage uncertainty and manage the way I emotionally handle it because you just don't know. And I've met freelancers that are way in demand, very, very popular, and they have that too. Sometimes they have months that aren't good and they worry. And I think you just have to become, you have to be able to embrace that or else it might not be the best choice for you because even at the biggest amounts of success you can get as a freelancer, there's massive uncertainty. Mm. I think it's also a good point to mention that besides the uncertainty, there's actually a lot of other things about freelancing that's not suited to everyone. I mean, you've got to be so disciplined. You've got to be self-disciplined. I mean, you, if you want to get out of bed and work in your pajamas all day, that's great. But, um, you know, you've got, to, you've got to get out of bed and go to work because no one's telling <laughs> you to do that, you know. I, I tell you something, that is something I really struggle with and that there's there's things that really don't set me up well for uh freelancers that i'm disorganized uh i'm not very strict on myself um and so and i something i that i really benefited from being in a job was having someone over me saying you need to do this 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 is the deadline for that i'm not very good at giving myself deadlines um and so i just want to put out there to those people who because i I try and fight against some of the things I'm not very naturally good at. One is being messy and um, clearing up after myself. And Mm -hmm. I'm constantly fighting it, but that's just who I am. And so I I have to consciously think about clearing up. And so it's the same with my disorganization and my um, deadlines and stuff like that. It's just something I have to deal with myself because I'm not very good at it. And there's a lot of people who are good at it. Uh, You know, so... 
know that you if you're not naturally talented at the business side don't worry (laughs) (laughs) yeah ian's living proof you can make it work (laughs) and also there's all kinds of scope like freelancer implies uh being very much solo Mm -hmm. but there's all kinds of people who can freelance as part of a partnership or something like Mm. that or even set themselves up as a, a small agency or, or something. Yeah. Like we, we work with an agency for um, social media stuff and there's two of them and they're really lovely. They seem to be great friends and they work really well together. And the beauty of that is you can balance each other. So if you just want to sit and create all day mm. and then you have someone who loves like marketing and business, then just pair off together and be freelancers together. That's a great point. I have a friend, um, Brad Woodard, and he's great at doing the illustrations, but he absolutely hates the, the paperwork side. And so his wife does all of Crystal does all of the invoicing and tracking things and making sure they get paid. And it works great. For I keep them. seeing this actually, like married couples who are working together. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah, I, I know it's bold. I'd, I'd kill sure. Cliff. I, I Cliff would imagine. kill me. It, we'd last for <laughs> two hours. That would be it. Dead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's crazy so any other tips for people who are looking to make the plunge um or who are in the midst of of doing this i think we've hopefully covered some good points actually yeah Um, i I would say one thing go for it dustin go ahead please go ahead um no i was just gonna say if if you've done your homework you've done all the things we kind of discussed about the next big thing which we all struggle with as creative it's creatives is to believe in ourselves so believe it's going to work um and i think i think that we're especially when you have a lot of people saying oh you're crazy you're leaving a Mm -hmm. well-paid job but it's not gonna work and it's it's tough out there and blah 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 yes it is to all those things but (laughs) Um, and if you, but if you put in the graft and you and you trust in yourself and 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 you really you know put in the effort, it, it'll work. It'll work. So you got to back yourself because not not many people are going to back you. I think one essential piece of the puzzle there is you need to set up the right Spotify playlist and definitely put on "I Believe I Can Fly" yeah. by R. <laughs> R. Kelly just to help with that Good mindset. Point. Yeah, we should build really a playlist for people. It'd be so yeah, funny. <laughs> the yeah. freelance transitioning playlist. Yeah. Yes, we should. <laughs> I, I was going to say, just for anyone else who's experienced this, I think if you're waking up in the middle of the night and wondering if you've made a horrible mistake or if you're not good enough, that's totally normal yeah. from people I know. I know I woke up and felt like my family thinks I'm living a pipe dream. What am I doing? I'm so silly. I can't believe I made this stupid decision to do this. I'm so delusional. Mm. I think that's a really common thing. I dealt with that a ton and I'm so glad that I pushed through it. And I know a lot of other people that have as well. So if you're doing that, that's totally okay and a normal feeling, I think. Yeah, I saw something recently where it was basically saying, do what scares you because the stuff that scares you is the stuff that's worth doing. You don't don't want to play it safe for your whole life. Um, Yeah, I I mean, if, if you're kind of terrified going into this thing, It doesn't mean it's wrong. It probably means the opposite. Thanks so much for listening to this week's episode. We hope that it showed you how following your creative dream can be possible. As always, you can find full show notes over at honestdesigners.com or find us over on iTunes by searching for The Honest Designers Show. If today's episode helped you, then it would mean the world to us if you took a moment to leave us a quick review over on iTunes, as this is the best way for other creatives to discover the show. The reviews have continued to pour in and we've loved reading every single one of them. You guys are seriously the best. Thanks again for tuning in and we'll see you next week right here on The Honest Designer Show.